okay so in this particular lecture we are going to talk about two very important theorems in basic number theory okay and i hope most of you have also you know heard about these two theorems that is the formats little theorem and wilson's theorem and wilson's theorem okay and while studying fermat's little theorem we will be discussing a more generalized version of it which we also called euler's theorem and we will discuss fermat's little theorem as a corollary of euler's theorem okay so let us first you know write the theorems and then we will be discussing the proofs of them and before understanding the proofs of them we will discuss the basis required to understand the proof okay so first let me write down what is the euler's theorem rather first let me discuss what is the phi function because it is it will be of very much use in this lecture euler's phi function euler's phi function now see we all have uh, more or less heard about the term co primes right right so we say writing it here we say a and b are co primes are co primes if and only if gcd of a and b is 1 right gcd is the greatest common divisor of two numbers d is the gcd of ab if and only if for number 1 d divides both a and b and point number 2 if there exists an integer f see in number theory we talk about integers only so i might not be you know discussing which number i'm talking about so you people have to understand that every number we talk about in this particular lecture are integers okay unless any restriction is specified so there is some f such that f divides a and f divides b then f must divide d okay this is the basic definition of what we call gcd or or if people have uh, un, you know learnt in lower classes what we call the acs right highest common factor the greatest common divisor okay the similar terms okay so whenever the gcd of two numbers is 1 we say that the those two numbers are co primes okay now now let n be a positive integer let's say suppose n is a positive integer phi of n phi of n which we call the euler's phi function phi of n is the is the number of co primes is the number of co primes of n okay so euler's phi function basically gives the number of co prime numbers of some specific value n is it understood for example for example let's say we have n is equals to 10 now what are the co primes of 10 what are the co primes of 10 see 1 right then we have 3 right then we have uh, 7 and we have 9 right these are the co primes with this gcd of 1 and 10 is 1 gcd of 3 and gcd of anything with 1 is 1 gcd of 3 and 10 is 1 gcd of 7 and 10 is 1 and gcd of 9 and 10 is 1 so phi of 10 must be 4 phi of 10 must be 4 this is the basic about euler's phi function now what is the formula for euler's phi function i'm giving that also but i am not not going to discuss the proof of euler's phi function in this particular lecture that might be in some different lecture okay so suppose suppose we have n as the product of primes like say p1 to the power alpha 1 p2 to the power alpha 2 and so on some pn to the power pm to the power alpha m where 
P1, P2 till Pm are all primes, distinct primes. Okay. This is the fundamental theorem of arithmetic where every number can be represented as a product of powers of its prime factors or as a product of primes you may say, product of distinct primes and the representation is always unique. Okay. Okay. So when you can write n as this, phi of n has the formula n times 1 minus 1 over p1 into 1 minus 1 over p2 and so on into 1 minus 1 over p m clear it's clear so what must be the value of phi 10 right what are the prime factors or what is the representation of 10 so it is 2 into 5 so that is 2 to the power 1 into 5 to the power 1 we don't we are not concerned with the powers as you can see so what is phi 10 so phi 10 is 10 into 1 minus 1 over 2 into 1 minus 1 over 5 right so this is 10 into 1 over 2 into 4 over 5 so 5 and 2 cancels 10 and we have left with 4 right clear any number you have you if you can represent its uh, representation as product of primes you can find the number of co-prime numbers to it okay suppose suppose you take a prime number suppose p is prime Suppose P is prime. Now, what is the definition of a prime number? The definition of prime number is that it has only two factors, itself and one. Right? Now, if it has only two factors, that is one and itself, then every number, see, one is co-prime to every number. So, one is co-prime to P as well. P itself cannot be co-prime to itself. Right? Right? Because every number can divide itself. So, the thing is that, what are the co-primes what are the co-primes of a prime number so every natural number every positive integer below p or till p minus 1 will be co-prime to p because they don't share any factor with p right so what what must must be the value of phi p so it must be p minus 1 and you can check it with the formula as well so it is p into 1 minus 1 over p what is see p has a prime number has its prime factorization as p equals to p to the power 1 right this is the simplest form so this p will get cancelled and you will get p minus 1 okay so phi of p is p minus 1 so i guess euler's phi function is clear now 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 what is the euler's theorem have i discussed the euler's theorem above no now we say what is the euler's theorem okay what is the euler's theorem so the Euler's theorem says, yeah. suppose we have two integers a and m and their GCD is 1. Okay, this is a representation of GCD, GCD of a and m and the GCD of GCD is 1, then that implies a to the power phi of m is congruent to 1 modulo m okay now this representation must be known to some of you must be unknown to some of you so we will discuss this representation as well so this is called the congruence representation i am going to discuss this also but just let me write the theorems first and i am giving a basic definition of what it basically means i will be discussing it in a much more detailed way in, in a bit see we say a modulo b sorry a uh, modulo c is b this is also one more representation we write it also like this both are equivalent representations this means c divides a minus b as simple as that okay and whenever a divide a is modulo 0 okay to some base c a is modulo c uh, sorry a is 0 modulo c then it is very basically c divides a okay so congruence is an another representation for divisibility you can say okay so basically it means that whenever you divide a to the power phi m you get the remainder one by m you get the remainder one so this is this is one more way of representing it okay this 
comes out to be the remainder if it is less than c i will be discussing it later okay first let us understand the theory so it it might get a bit confusing so the basic thing is that this minus 1 is divisible by a that is the main theory and from here we can get the corollary which is the fermat's little theorem which is the fermat's little theorem which says that for a prime p for a prime p n to the power p is congruent to n mod p okay n to the power p is congruent to n mod p clear clear provided no this can be written directly yeah okay you 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 might find one more representation of this this has various representation for for a once you get this representation in books n to the power p minus n sorry n to the power yeah n to the power p minus n is congruent to 0 mod p this is one of the uh, representation you will get one more representation you get is n to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p this is also a sort of representation you get but here n needs to be not divisible by p if n n is divisible by p then the theorem fails because the left hand side becomes zero and the right hand side you have one right what i'm trying to say is it clear is it clear okay okay got it so since this is a corollary from euler's theorem so it is pretty much obvious that this number n must be co prime to p right so it must not be divisible by p that is the main thing which i want to discuss is it clear and we have the wilson's theorem right we have the wilson's theorem while discussing the wilson's theorem we will also discuss a more generalized version of it <coughs> but you can write wilson's theorem like this that m minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 mod m if and only if m is a prime number m is a prime number and one more representation you get from here is that or p divides p minus 1 factorial plus 1 okay this is one representation you get where you are declared that p is a prime number where you are declared that p is a prime number here you are given that p is prime and this says that this statement can hold only if the number is a prime number okay so this is a more <coughs> more generalized version of the wilson theorem is it clear is it clear okay so move on to the next page to understand the concepts and before that i am going to talk about what we actually mean by the term congruences okay then it will be easier for us to understand the concepts okay now we people have heard the term divisibility right we people have heard the term divisibility and divisibility comes as a direct result of what we call the euclid's division algorithm right what is the euclid's division algorithm or you know somewhere it is in euclid's division lemma you can also say euclid's division lemma euclid's division lemma the, the euclid's division algorithm is basically a process we use to find the gcd of two numbers okay. so that is more discussed as a process that is more discussed as a process while the division lemma is a statement you can say it's a statement you can say so euclid's division lemma is what we are going to talk about and euclid's division algorithm is a process related to a repeating process and algorithm is a a code code type of process related to euclid's division lemma so the euclid's division lemma says that for all integers a b when b is not equals to 0 
when b is not equals to 0 or rather let, let me not take this into consideration at this moment there exists q and r there exists q and r such that such that a can be written as bq plus r where r is greater than or equal to 0 and less than b and b needs to be positive b needs to be positive okay this is what we call the euclid's division lemma understanding this is pretty simple for example you have 4 so 4 can be written as 1 into 3 plus 1 right right We generally talk about positive numbers only. The, see, the major major discussion about number theory is related to natural numbers. Very simple. Okay, positive integers, natural numbers. Okay. Now, if r is equals to zero, then we have a is equals to b q, and this this representation leads us to this concept that b divides a. Okay. So, B divides A basically means that A is some multiple of B. Okay. A is some multiple of B. Clear? For example, 6 is divided by 3 or 3 divides 6 because 6 is 2 times 3. Okay. I think this, this is a very basic level of understanding for students. Is it clear? So, this is what we call the Euclid's division lemma and this is, this is divisibility. This is the basic of divisibility okay b divides a if and only if a, a can be done as b times q okay this is the concept of divisibility okay now let us discuss a few properties of divisibility and then we will moving on to the concept of congruences okay so properties properties of divisibility let's say <coughs> so any number can divide itself, right? Or any number can divide the mod of itself. Any number can divide the modulus of itself. I will be discussing the proof in a, in a very simple way. See, one can divide any number. One can divide the modulus of any number rather, let's say. Okay. Mod of 1, that is both 1 and minus 1, can divide any number. And... Third one is a more important one. If D divides A and D divides B, then D divides a linear combination of A and B. This is called a linear combination of A and B. Okay. Is it clear? Now see, these statements are very simple to prove. I am just giving the proof in a few lines. The first one, let's say. See. A can be written as a into 1 right so this implies a divides a clear a can be written as minus a into minus 1 so we can also say that minus a divides a clear see a can be written as a into 1 so 1 divides a Clear? You can write the statements on your own. Also, a can be written as minus a into minus 1. So, minus 1 also divides a. So, this part is clear. Rather, see, a can be written as a into 1, which we got from here, and minus a can be written as minus a into 1. So, 1 will also divide minus a. So, 1 divides both a and minus a. Clear? Third one, let's see. See, d divides a. d divides a means a is dk, suppose. K be a positive integer because we are concerned with natural numbers only so d divides b suppose so b can be done as say d k dash okay k dash belongs to positive integers so from here what is ax plus by so ax plus by is basically d k into x plus d k dash into y since these are all positive integers we can apply associativity in multiplication so we can group kx and k dash y here and we can take d out from the whole 
so it becomes d into k x plus plus k dash y and this is obviously divisible by d so this means d divides a x plus b y since k k dash x and y all are integers so k x plus k dash y is also a positive integer so d divides a x plus b y is it clear is it clear got it so this is the concept related to division or divisibility rather we can say now to understand congruences this much you know uh, discussion about divisibility is enough congruences let's say congruences so the basic definition we will be starting with is that a is congruent to b modulo c implies a minus b is congruent to zero modulo c that is that is or rather let, let us not use this definition at this moment okay so this, this means c divides a minus b okay got it got it this is what we call the <coughs> concept of congruences concept of congruences is it clear also this relation or rather you know uh, so what we basically mean is that see suppose we declare a relation okay so we define we define a relation a a related to b if and only if a is congruent to b modulo c suppose we can obviously check that this is a this is an equivalence relation this is an equivalence relation equivalence relation means that this relation is reflexive transitive and symmetric so those three become the first three properties of congruences is this part clear i am moving on to the next page okay so the properties of congruences you might say that a <coughs> is congruent to a mod c number b number 2 if a is congruent to b mod c then b is congruent to a mod c and number 3 if a is congruent to b mod c and b is congruent to d mod c then a is congruent to d mod c these are the first few first first three properties so this is the reflexivity this is the reflexivity this is the symmetric nature and this is transitive nature proving them is also quite simple okay the point number 1 See, this is one more property of divisibility. I missed that there. Any positive integer can divide zero because anything times zero is zero. So suppose C divides zero. What does that mean? So that means C divides A minus A. This means A is congruent to A modulo C. Number two, let's see. Suppose A is congruent to B modulo C. It is given A is congruent to B modulo C. So that means A minus B is a multiple of C. That means B minus A. Is still a multiple of C, where just the multiplier changes to its negative additive inverse. You might you might say, right? And k is a positive integer. Rather, k is an integer if you if you take for consideration k is an integer. So minus k is also an integer. Okay. See, we change our restriction of numbers according to our need. Okay. When we when we discuss theorem, the more generalized way of considering the numbers is taking them as integers. Okay, because while proving theorems or while stating theorems or while solving problems, we often need to use the additive inverses of every number. So considering the whole integer line is is a, it makes makes the problem quite simpler. Okay, so is it understood? So from here we can say that b minus a or rather b is congruent to a modulo c because b minus a is divided by c. Clear? Number three, let's see. So a is congruent to b modulo c means a minus b is a multiple of c. B my uh, b is congruent to d modulo c means b minus d is a is another multiple of c. We add these two, so we get a minus d is equals to c times k plus k dash. K and k and k dash both are integers, so k plus k dash is also an integer. So from here we get a is congruent to d modulo c. Clear? Got it? 
the next set of properties which are also very important and very applicable as well so we take suppose suppose a is congruent to b modulo c and x is congruent to y modulo c then number 1 a plus minus x is congruent to b plus minus y modulo c number 2 a into x is congruent to b into y modulo c clear clear got it got it now proving them is quite simple see if you uh, take here that a minus b is equals to ck and x minus y is equals to ck dash then on adding them and subtracting them we will get your answer also multiplying them will also give you the answer you can it is very very simple to prove very minimum knowledge about algebra is required to prove this okay <clears throat> one more important uh, property related to congruences is that uh, which we call the cancellation law which we call the cancellation law suppose bd is congruent to bd dash congruent bd is congruent to bd dash modulo c then that implies d is congruent to d dash modulo c if and only if gcd of b and c is one okay this is called the cancellation law now how does this come c c bd dash bd is congruent to bd dash modulo c then bd minus bd dash is some multiple of c so we can take b common so d minus d dash is equals to ck since gcd of b and c equals to 1 that implies that implies c cannot divide b so that implies c must divide d minus d dash clear clear or you can do this directly using this statement as well clear clear got it okay 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 so let us move to the next page okay now we have already seen that the congruence relation is an equivalence relation and we all already know I, i assume you people already know that whenever we can <coughs> form an equivalence relation we can form corresponding equivalence classes right suppose suppose this is an equivalence relation suppose this is an equivalence relation we can form corresponding equivalence classes equivalence classes using numbers from the from the domain of the relation as so you often write it is like this so equivalence class of a is the set of all those numbers in d d is the domain such that x is related to a okay So equivalence class is basically the set of all those numbers which are related to that number. Okay. So in case of congruences, we define the equivalence class with respect to <coughs> the number whose modulo we are taking and the number whom we are dividing or whose class we are forming as a residue system. Okay. In case of equivalence classes where the equivalence relation is the congruence. operator we define that class to be a residue system okay it is a term used a residue system okay a residue system okay so see <coughs> i'm giving the definition here of a residue system if say a and b both are integers and a is congruent to b modulo c then b 
is a residue of A modulo C. Is it clear? Is it clear? Got it? Got it? So got it. So this is the definition of a residue. Collection of all the residues gives you a residue system. Okay. So one more definition. One more definition is that the set of integers. The set of integers. Say R one, R two, and so on, till R S. Let's say. is called a residue system rather a complete residue system is called a complete residue system modulo c modulo c if point number 1 ri is not at all congruent to any rj modulo c For i not equals to j, so that is they are mutually incongruent modulo c. And number two, for all possible n, for all possible integers we have, there exists some i such that n is congruent to r i modulo c. So in very simple words, it means that a complete residue system. is a collection of all possible remainders which are mutually incongruent which you can get when you divide any possible integer by c is it clear now i have not given the perspective of why i am calling the right hand side of the congruence of it as a remainder i am telling you it right now see suppose you take two numbers let's say 44 and 33 okay now 40 is 44 minus 33 it is 11 and 11 is divisible by 11 right so can we write 44 is congruent to 33 modulo 11 is it clear is it clear now 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 the thing is that What is the remainder you get when you divide forty-four by eleven? You get zero, right? You get zero. Okay, let me not do it like this. I have taken a very wrong example, so I'm sorry. Let me take one more example, a proper example at this moment. Let me take a thirty-two um, and and say thirty-two. And say twenty six, okay. And we take modulo three. So thirty two when divided by three. So thirty two minus twenty six is six. So it is it is thirty two is congruent to twenty six modulo three, okay. <coughs> Now, what do you get as a remainder when you divide thirty two by three? So you get thirty two ten two. You get two. You get two. And what do you get on the right hand side? Twenty six. You also get two, right? And this is a trivial statement. This is a trivial statement, right? So in these sort of cases, in these sort of cases, what we can do is that the right hand side twenty six, we can bring twenty six to such a number which is less than three. We can keep dividing twenty six by whatever modulo we are given. and we can bring 26 down to 3 the reason is the reason is 26 is congruent to 2 modulo 3 so we can replace 2 by 26 in this particular statement so 32 <coughs> okay is it understood is it understood the right hand side is simply the remainder you get when you divide 32 by 3 okay so whenever in a congruence operator the right hand side is less than c or is than the modulo you are given then that is simply the remainder you get when you divide 
the number by the modulo. Is it clear? This is what I was trying to explain. Got it? So I'm rubbing this portion. This is just an idea. <coughs> now, now, so is, is it understood? Is it understood? Okay. So now see. Now this is what we call a complete residue system modulo C. Okay. Uh, with respect to this com uh, complete residue system, we have one more thing which we call a reduced uh, residue system. What we call the reduced residue system. So I am writing it the set. The set of integers. The set of integers. R1, R2, till say Rk. Is called. Is called. A reduced. A reduced. Residue system. Congruent. Re reduced residue system modulo C. If, if point number one is same, that is, R i is incongruent R j modulo C for all i not equals to j. Point number two, that the GCD of any number from the set with this congruent C, this modulo C is one. That is, every single number present in this set is the is a, is a co-prime with is is co-prime with C. Okay, for all i. And number three is that whatever we have used here, that is for all n, for all n such that GCD of n and c is one. Okay. Okay. There exists. There exists R i such that n is congruent to Ri modulo C. Okay, so basically the reduced residue system is is the is a subset of the complete residue system where the numbers only are the co-primes of the modulo. <coughs> is it clear? So can we say what, what is the cardinal cardinality of this particular set? It is simply is equals to phi a phi c, right? Phi c. Got it? Okay. Now, if we have a prime number p, then what its residue system must look like? C. Suppose C is prime. Suppose C is prime. Then what is its complete residue system? Suppose I write it as Z C. What is its complete residue system? So, what are all the possible remainders you might get? When you divide a certain number by C, if it is divisible, you get 0. If it is 1 more, you get 1. If it is 2 more, you get 2 and so on till C minus 1. Right? It is a direct result from Euclid's division lemma, right? See, A is equals to say C Q plus R and this R is greater than or equals to 0 and less than C. So, what are all the possible integral values of R? 0, 1 till C minus 1. Okay? And if C is prime, if C is prime, okay, I am writing it as Z star, okay, then what are the values from Z C are taken? Everything except 0, so we have 1, 2 and so on till C minus 1, because every number is co prime to P, co prime to C rather we are using C notation here, okay. Now, this is a concept which we will be using now. Now, we are going to prove the, I think you people have understood the concept. So, now we are going to prove the Euler's theorem first and we are going to declare formats little theorem as a direct corollary of Euler's theorem. Okay. So, Euler's theorem. This is pretty simple. See, Euler's theorem. Now, what does the Euler's theorem say? Let me just recall. So, provided a and m, the city of a and m is 1, then that implies a to the power of phi m is congruent to 1 modulo m. Right? Now, now, what is z star m? z star m is r1, r2 and so on till r phi m. 
so there are five m such values the residue system of it right if we multiply a to each of them if we multiply a to each of them okay a times z star m let's say so it is a r1 a r2 and so on till r 5 m now now sorry a times r 5 m now this still remains a residue system this still remains a residue system the reason being a is co prime to m a is co prime to m every single number you have here are co primes to m so multiplying with a co prime number doesn't cause any difference to the remainder you are going to get so this still remains a residue system i'm not saying it's a complete or or not saying it's reduced it's it's a residue system <coughs> clear now if you multiply all of them so you get ar1 times ar2 and so on till ar5 and the product of them is congruent to the product of each individual number from the reduced residue system right right m because they cause no difference i have just said that they are the a is co prime to m and each individual number is also co prime to m so multiplying with a does not cause any any change to the remainder we are going to get so from here we can say that this is a to the power 5m because a is multiplied 5m times and here you have r1 times r2 sorry till r 5m and on the right hand side you also have r1 times r2 till r 5m modulo m and in this case you can use the cancellation law because because every single number is co prime to m right co prime to m, so that means the product is not divisible by m or rather the product is co prime to m no the product is co prime to m and when they are co prime we can cancel out them so from here what we get a to the power 5m is congruent to one modulo m clear so from here we take the corollary into consideration that is for m is equals to p prime number we have a to the power p minus 1 congruent to 1 mod p that is a to the power p is congruent to a modulo p that's the formats little theorem that's the formats little theorem clear clear now let us prove the now let us prove the wilson's theorem okay let us prove the wilson's theorem we are going to prove the generalized version or more more standard version of the wilson's theorem okay so the wilson's what is the more uh, generalized version of wilson's theorem it says that m minus 1 factorial plus 1 is congruent to 0 mod p sorry yeah let us use whatever is given in most of the books okay same minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 modulo m if and only if m is prime okay so let us first check for m being prime let's first check for m being prime okay, so we consider m so we consider m to be prime <coughs> okay i am not going to give the detailed proof here Okay, I'm just going to prove when, whenever m is prime, this is true. Okay, so suppose, suppose. Acha, before moving on to this, let let me first discuss a thing. See, for all a, for all number a, there exists some a dash, a dash such that a times a dash is congruent to one mod p, one mod m rather, where m is a prime number, and this a dash is called the inverse of a this might not be prime about any arbitrary device that you have this okay inverse of a multiplicative inverse of a so if a is equals to a dash then what we have then we have a square is congruent to 1 mod m and from here we have m divides a square minus 1 or m divides a minus 1 into a plus 1 since a m is prime Since m is prime, so m either divides a minus one or m divides a plus one. So from here, what we get that either a is congruent, so a is congruent to plus minus one mod m, right? Now since m is prime, what is its 
what is its complete residue system so it consists of rather what is its reduced residue system well, we are not using zero here let's say so zero is a zero remainder coming out zero is also kind of you can say as a trivial case so what is the reduced residue system so it is 1 2 and so on till m minus 1 now a is congruent to minus 1 mod m it is equivalent to m minus 1 mod m okay so m minus 1 and 1 gets cancelled out as the trivial case because this these two happen whenever the inverse of a number is same as itself okay so now we can talk about the rest of the numbers that is 2 3 till m minus 2 now it is practically evident that we can arrange or we can pair every number from this set as inverses right let me say suppose you have the prime number say 5 so what will the residue system uh, without 1 and m minus 1 have so we'll have 2 and 3 what is 2 times 3 it is 6 and 6 is 1 mod 5 that is let me take 11 okay we, we have 11 let's say so the this system must be 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 and okay 8 and 9 now see we can have see 2 we have 2 here and 2 times 6 2 into 6 is 1 mod 11 3 into uh, 3 into 7 is uh, no 21 we have 11 22 there must be any number so 9 times 3 7 3 7 into 3 is 21 we have 22 there so we are dividing by 11 so we need 1 right 4 times 3 4 times 3 12 12 is 1 mod 11 right 5 into 49 45 45 is 1 mod 11 and 7 into 56 is 1 mod 11 okay so we can group pair we can we can form pairwise groups which are inverses of each other okay so so if you multiply all of them so which implies 2 into 3 and so on till m minus 2 is basically congruent to 1 into 1 and so on to 1 because whenever you group them into the inverses into groups of inverses each of them will give you one modulo m right each of them will give you one modulo m okay one modulo m so this is congruent to one modulo m is it clear now this can be written as m minus 2 factorial is congruent to one modulo m if you multiply m minus 1 on both sides since m minus 1 is co prime to m so here we have m minus 1 and m is divisible by m so we get m minus 1 factorial is congruent to minus 1 modulo m clear clear this gives the wilson's theorem that is whenever m is prime whenever m is prime we have m divide m minus 1 factorial plus 1 clear now what if what if m is not prime what if m is not prime can you show that this statement would will not hold if m is not prime so we can prove this by contradiction very simply see if if if, if m is not prime then there exists some a which is greater than a and less than m such that a divides m if a divides m then a must be less as if if a falls in this range then a must be any number from m minus 1 factorial or from the numbers between 1 and m so m, a must also divide divide m minus 1 factorial right now what is what if m so let m minus 1 factorial plus 1 is equals to m times k okay so we are taking the wilson's theorem to be true so from here we can say m k minus m minus 1 factorial is congruent to 1 sorry is equals to 1 now since a divides m a divides m minus 1 factorial that implies so left hand right hand side so if left hand side is completely divisible by a the right hand side must also be divisible by a so, right so a must divide 1 but that's a contradiction since a is greater than 1 it cannot divide 1 so that implies wilson's theorem won't won't hold 
Wilson's theorem will not hold true. Is it clear? So I hope you people enjoyed this lecture. So let this lecture be up till this point, guys. In the next lecture, we are going to talk about something more interesting. So meet you guys in the next lecture.